That's what I love about Jesus. And then you ask them, what do you make of Jesus? He is the heart and soul of our evangelism. Please do have a seat. And if you want to turn back to the New Testament reading on page 1015, we'll be spending some time in 1 Peter, page 1015. And as we turn there, let me pray for us that we would hear from God personally and powerfully, that he would address us in the core of our beings. Let's pray now. Almighty and heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you that you are the speaking God. And we pray that now you would speak into our lives with living power. Show us your eternal word, the Lord Jesus, so that in his face we might see what you are truly like and what we are truly like. We pray this for the honor and glory of Jesus. Amen. So I've been introduced to you as an evangelist. I wonder what connotations that term has in your thinking. I wonder what you imagine when you imagine that strange breed called an evangelist. Bring to mind now the pictures, the word associations, the adjectives you'd use to describe such a specimen. What are you thinking about? Very often I, I go around and try to help Christians think about how to be evangelists in their everyday lives, and I ask them that question, and they feed back to me. I've stopped doing that now because it's just so very hurtful. The kind of things that people say when they think of an evangelist, they think of this like dreadful alpha type personality, usually with a massive beard and a megaphone on some street corner, big placard, some kind of personal hygiene problem usually. And that's what an evangelist is. And, and, they, and they hurl these insults at me, even though I've told them I am one. And I tell them it's hurting my feelings. Of course, they don't believe me because they don't think any evangelists actually have feelings. We're these sort of reptilian creatures with thick skin and fire in our bellies. And that's what an evangelist is, right? And yet what I so often do is I then ask people the question, okay, now talk to your neighbor about someone who was helpful in you coming to faith. Describe that person. There's probably lots of people in your journey to faith, but just pick one and describe that person to your neighbor for the next 90 seconds. And the room fills up with a hubbub of just joyful noise about people talking about, yeah, he was so kind, or she just had such an integrity to her. He had such a quiet spirit. All these lovely kind of adjectives and phrases are being generated at this stage. And we, we rejoice in these people who had helped us come to faith. But there's a massive problem, isn't there? Like, because all of those people are tremendous evangelists, aren't they? Tremendous evangelists, because look at what they've done. Look at how they have shepherded people to faith in Christ. And yet we never think of those people as evangelists. We always think of the, the thick-skinned kind of thunderous preacher. And I wonder whether we do that because then it helps us to wash our hands of the whole business. If that's what an evangelist is, well, it's clearly not me, so I don't need to be involved in the life of witness. And so often we divorce the evangelist from the rest of the Christian life, from just the rest of discipleship, the rest of pastoral care. I mean... Do a thought experiment now. I've asked you to imagine an evangelist. Now imagine a pastor, someone who's really pastoral. Now try to think of that person. You're, think of, you're thinking of the sort of person who just manages to cock their head at almost 90 degrees and nods at everything you says and say, and, you know, and how does that make you feel? And puts on the kettle and makes you a lovely cup of tea. And they're, they're wearing lovely paisley colors, aren't they? These pastoral people. And we think of them as these lovely people, these pastoral people. And the evangelists we want to steer clear of. You probably need a pastoral visitation after you've had a, an evangelistic visitation, right? And we think of this as, as 
completely separate kinds of people. And yet, what I want to get across to you this evening is that really, it's the same thing, okay? Evangelism is just pastoring non-Christians. And pastoral care is just evangelizing Christians, right? Evangelizing just means sharing the gospel with, gospeling somebody else. Pastoral care is just telling a believer the good news. And what is evangelism? Evangelism is pastoring a non-Christian. And we need to have this category for what evangelism looks like because all of us, I hope all of us know how to pastor ourselves and one another through difficult times in life, which is so often what pastoral care is. Can we use some of those same skills and some of those same giftings to turn our attention to our non-Christian friends and pastor them through difficult times? One person who I think learnt this was the Apostle Peter. We often think of Peter as a great evangelist because he was the ultimate fisher of men, the original fisher of men. There he is in Luke 5 and he's fishing for fish and Jesus says, I will now call you to become a fisher of men, the, this original evangelist. And I can imagine that Peter, when he first got going as an evangelist, he went to the Christian bookshop that was nearby and, and he got out all the paperbacks that told him to be, how, you know, how to be a fire-breathing evangelist, right? And, and because he's just brilliantly typical, isn't he, as this sort of negative style of evangelist, isn't he? Brilliant at just shooting his mouth off with no pastoral regard for anybody. Think of the night before Jesus dies. There is Peter, he's leading the evangelist's conference, and he says, if, even if everyone else departs from you, Jesus, I never will. I'm iron for you, Jesus. And he's such a great evangelist that he kind of gets everyone else in the room G'd up in the same way, and they all say the same thing. But of course, that same pride sows the seeds of his own failure. Just within hours, he's actually denying Jesus, even to the servant girl. That kind of evangelist is really put to death on Good Friday. But then on Easter Sunday, there's that restoration of Peter. And remember how Jesus confronts Peter at the same fire. There was a fire where he had denied Jesus, and now Jesus confronts him at a different fire. And three times he asks him, Peter, do you love me? And three times Peter says, yes, I love you. And then what does Jesus say? He says, feed my sheep. Like, ah, he started out as a fisherman, and now he's becoming a pastoral fisherman a shepherding kind of fisherman. And he's reestablished and recommissioned as a witness to Christ, as a pastor of the sheep. And that's why I love 1 Peter, because really 1 Peter is him going to town on pastoral evangelism. He's, he's learnt what it is to found his witness on love for Christ and pastoring of the flock. And so he writes this, letter to this bedraggled mob of scattered believers. 1 Peter 1 speaks of the elect exiles of the dispersion. Can you imagine the, ref imagine the pictures of the refugee crisis last year? That's what we're meant to think of as this dispersion. People chased, hounded out of their own homes, and now they've found themselves in what we would call Turkey today, Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. But even though they are these elect exiles, this bedraggled mob of struggling believers, yet, verse 2, they are foreknown by God the Father, they are sanctified by God the Spirit, and they are owned and cleansed by Jesus Christ the Son. It's a wonderful Trinitarian blessing, really. In the world's eyes, they are a bedraggled mob, but they are gripped by the triune God. And Peter commissions them to their work of witness. And he does it in this wonderful verse, chapter 2, verse 9. Famous words where Peter takes these words that first of all applied to uh, the Israelites coming out of Egypt and being commissioned at Mount Sinai. And now he applies those same words to this New Testament people. He says, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So here is 
the context for a new believer. They have been saved out of darkness and brought into the church. But Peter doesn't just call what we belong to the church. He calls it a priesthood. Well, that's interesting. What is a priesthood? Well, a, a priesthood is a group of people who bring you to God. They bring God to the people, and they bring the people to God. They are go-betweens. And back in the Old Testament, the Levites, one of the 12 tribes, they were the priests, and they were bringing God to the rest of the nation of Israel. And now, Peter says, ah, just as the Levites ministered the Lord to the rest of Israel, you now, the church, minister to the Lord to the rest of the nations. And that is your very identity. You are this royal priesthood. Now, imagine back in the Old Testament, if the Levites were commissioned to be this priesthood, and they said, I quite like being a priesthood. This is great. Why do we need Israel? Let's, let's forget the, uh, the other 11 tribes. Let's just hive off by ourselves and just exist for ourselves. You know, Joseph, you could cook, and, and we, we could just have fun together, couldn't we? Can't we just hunker down and be Levites all by ourselves? And, of course, that is a nonsense, isn't it? Because you cannot be priestly by yourself. In order to be priestly, you must be for the others. And in order for the church to be the church, we must be the church for the nations. We must be. It is the very nature of the case. Who we are, we are irreducibly a witness. We are irreducibly a light, as Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5. In fact, the light of the world. We are this city on a hill that is unmistakable, that cannot hide itself. And our very being is in being outgoing. So before we ever think about tips and techniques of how to share your faith and how to turn a conversation into gospel directions and all those sorts of things, before we ever think about what we do in our witness, Peter wants us to know who we are in our witness. We are already a missionary body. That is simply who you are. Here you are, JPC, in Jesmond, in Newcastle, and to the ends of the earth. This, this is who you are, this missionary body. Which means the first sentence up your sleeve that I'm going to share with you that you can take into your individual witness is, is just, that's what I love about my church, dot, dot, dot. How would you use that sentence in your witness with friends and family and neighbors? How can you finish that sentence? That's what I love about my church, dot, dot, dot. Hopefully, there's things you can say, I hope. Hopefully, there are things you love about being a part of JPC. And listen, if you, if you don't usually come to church, if you don't perhaps call yourself a Christian, let me, let me try this out on you right now, okay? This is how I finish that sentence. That's what I love about my church. It really is family. Uncannily, it's like family. I spend my time going to lots of different churches, and I meet brothers and sisters. I don't just meet fellow Christians. I meet brothers and sisters who have a concern for me that is just out of this world, and it is, it is not explicable in human earthly terms. Emma and I live in Eastbourne. My, my family are an ocean away. Her family are from Northern Ireland, a, an ocean away. And yet, both our families are astonished by the love that our church family shows to us. Uh, Emma's from Northern Ireland, as I say, and her, her dad's not a believer at all. He uh, showed up um, on our doorstep after coming to church. He came to church this one Sunday last year. And uh, as we came back to church, clearly someone from our church had left uh, a, a travel cot on our front doorstep. And uh, I, maybe it's something to do with being from Northern Ireland. Maybe an unaccompanied kind of baggage, you know, was, was uh, setting off uh, alarm bells in his mind. But he, he said, what's this? And we said, oh, I don't know. It looks like a travel cot. And he said, well, who does it belong to? And we said, I don't know. It looks like someone's left it here. He said, well, who's left it here? We said, I, I don't know, they haven't left a name. He said, well, when do they want it back? I, I, like, I don't know when they want it back because they probably would have left a note if they wanted it back. He said, they've just given it to you? And I said, oh, yeah. 
oh yeah, let, let me show you around our house. And then we, we go back in, inside and, and I take him around the, you know, the baby's room and I was like, Phil and Esther got us this and this is from Phil and this is from Joe and this is from, you know, and I just take him around the, the whole house and just show him the way that the church has loved us. And that is making a huge impact on him. That's what I love about my church, dot, dot, dot. There is a love that is out of this world that Christians have enjoyed. And Jesus said, didn't he say in John chapter 12, rather John chapter 13, verse 35, by this all people will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. And the love of the Christian church is a huge witness out to the nations. Who we are as church is a huge witness already. So that's the first thing. The first thing is, that's what I love about my church. But then, as we move from our being to thinking about how we do evangelism, here's this famous verse over the page on page 1016, verse 15. Chapter 3, verse 15. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. So here is a missionary encounter. And the, and the person who's actually initiated this missionary encounter is not the Christian. Did you notice that? Someone else is looking on at your life. And they're saying, I don't know how you do it. I don't know how you cling on in the midst of your struggles. Obviously, in 1 Peter, the church is going through a lot of struggles. They are refugees. They are far from home. From chapter 2, verse 13, Peter starts talking to them about uh, uh, these authorities that are causing them pain and struggle. From chapter 2, verse 18, he talks about workplace situations that cause them pain and struggle. From chapter 3, verse 1, he starts talking about marital situations, family situations that are causing them pain and struggle. And yet, with all that pain and struggle, Peter keeps on saying, I, I'm so thrilled that you're suffering well and clinging to Christ. Keep going. Suffer well and cling to Christ. Suffer well, cling to Christ. Suffer well, cling to Christ. Such that by the time you get to chapter 3, verse 15, there are non-Christians looking on saying, I don't know how you do it. How did you survive last year? That family breakdown, those series of operations you had to go through, that legal difficulty you got into, your, your business going belly up, I, I, how did you get through that? And what does evangelism look like? It just looks like saying, I don't know. I don't know how I got through. Somehow Jesus got me through. That's kind of what 1 Peter 3.15 is all about. You know, sometimes we read this verse and it says, you know, you need to be ready to make a defense to anyone who asks you, uh, it might sound like you need to be like this incredibly clever person with a PhD in philosophy and you've read Thomas Aquinas and you know his five arguments for the existence of God and you can roll them out at will. It's not that. It is so not that. The context for 1 Peter 3.15 is people looking on at the way you have survived suffering and they ask, how do you do it? And really the response is, I don't know. Somehow Jesus has got me through. That is the hope that is within you. That's the reason why you are able to keep going. And so the second sentence up our sleeve, we've had, that's what I love about my church, dot, dot, dot. How about this one? I couldn't have gotten through X without Jesus. Can you finish that sentence off? I couldn't have gotten through whatever it is for you without Jesus. That is sharing the hope that is within you. It's Jesus alone who can offer you that. And again, if you're not a Christian here this evening, let me finish off that sentence for you. I, I couldn't have gotten through today without Jesus, let me be honest. And I don't know how you get through life without Jesus. I honestly don't. Because if I stepped out of here and if I believed what the world wants me to believe about life, I would have no hope because what the world wants me to believe is that I am a biological survival machine clinging to an insignificant rock, hurtling through a meaningless universe towards eternal extinction. 
But you know, Starbucks has the new pumpkin spice latte, so that's good. <laughs> and we're doing up the kitchen, so that's something to look forward to. And I'm about to book my summer holiday, so... Is that hope? You're a biological survival machine clinging to an insignificant rock, hurtling through a meaningless universe towards eternal extinction. That's not hope. How do you live? How do you live? Without Jesus, how do you do it? So often people will ask you, how do you get through your suffering? And you say, well, with Jesus, because he actually gives me hope. He, he plunged down into our death and he punched a hole through death, came out the other side to offer me immortal hope for free and forever. The real question is, how do you get through? How do you get through your suffering? What hope do you have? So here are our two questions so far. I couldn't have... Uh, the first one is, that's what I love about my church. The second is, I couldn't have gotten through X without Jesus. And then the third sentence is really based on this same verse. That's what I love about Jesus, dot, dot, dot. How do, how do you finish this sentence? Because after you've shared with somebody, the reason I've been able to get through my suffering is Jesus. You need to be able to talk about Jesus. Well, who is this Jesus? that you love so much. And what is it that you love about him? Well, I, I love chapter 3, verse 18. Don't you love this? Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. Isn't that a, a stunning little encapsulation of the gospel? Because here we are, sinking down in this world into the grave. And here we are in all our selfishness, and we're reaping reaping the rewards of our own selfishness every day, living in sin, living under condemnation, tumbling down into the grave. And yet, what does Jesus do? Well, Jesus does what love does. What does love do? If love sees the beloved in trouble, love says, your trouble will be my trouble. Your pit will be my pit. Your pain will be my pain. Your debts will be my debts. Your death will be my death. And so in his love, Christ also suffered once for sins on that cross. He was the righteous one suffering for we, the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. What do you love about Jesus? He's the God who shows up. He's the God who loves us more than his own life with his arms nailed open for the world, bleeding for his enemies, he offers himself to you. That's what I love about Jesus. What if God was like that? Is this a God you could believe in? If God's like this, what do you reckon? Are you in? Are you in? If you start answering in the affirmative, watch out. You might just become a Christian. When people start to say, you know what, this Jesus, he's, he's awesome, he's tops, he's numero uno, he's, he's, he's Lord. <gasps> Look out, bad luck, you're a Christian at that stage. If you start calling him Lord, goodness me. Romans 10 verse 9 says, anyone who calls him Lord and believes that he's risen from the dead, you're saved. Bad luck, you're a Christian, right? What do you reckon? What do you reckon about this Jesus? We've had our three questions. That's what I love about my church. Can you finish that sentence? I couldn't have gotten through X without Jesus. How would you finish that sentence? That's what I love about Jesus. How do you finish that sentence? And then you can kind of turn those sentences into questions. You know, as you ask people, that's what I love about my church, you can just say, do you want to visit mine? Do you want to come along? Come along. I'll cook you lunch afterwards. I'll cook you dinner afterwards. You can tell me how much you hated it. That's fine, but come along. I couldn't have gotten through X without Jesus. Just ask people, how do you get through hard times? Open up that conversation. That's what I love about Jesus. And then you ask them, what do you make of Jesus? He is the heart and soul of our evangelism. You know, pastoral care is evangelizing Christians. And evangelism is just pastoring non-Christians pointing them to the good shepherd and saying, look and live. Let's bow our heads and be quiet for a second. Let me pray for us.
Our Father, we praise you for such good news. The world does not have good news, and we do. The Lord Jesus has conquered sin and death and hell and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. We have this good news. Lord, fill our hearts with this good news and send us out as heralds, as witnesses, as priests, as those who are go-betweens, declaring your praises to a world that so desperately needs you. And Father, if there are those here who have not yet said yes to Jesus, I pray that even now they'd call out in their hearts and say, Jesus, it is dark here and I need you. And I pray that even tonight there'll be those crossing from that darkness into your wonderful light. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.